Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Raw Code Live. I'm your host, Raw Code. Today, we're going to be taking a look at GetPod. Uh, before we do that, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to my employer, Equinix Metal. They are a bare metal cloud, and they provide the time and the resources that allows me to invest in this show and produce great cloud-native learning materials so we can all learn together. If you want to check out Equinix Metal, please visit metal.equinix.com and use the code rawcode-live. This will give you $50 of credit. That $50 can get you roughly 100 hours of compute on our smallest instance. So check it out, have some fun, and let me know how you get on. Now, today to look at GetPod, I am joined by two uh, of their great team members, Christian and Sven. Hello, how are you both? Hi, David. Hey, good. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh, would you just like to just take a moment to first introduce yourselves, and then we'll talk about what GetPod is and how it can help us. Chris, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can have a go. So my name is Chris. Uh, I'm the chief architect at GetPod. And uh, my role is to um, make sure we stay sort of technically coherent and you know decide on how we build this uh, or guide the discussion on how we build this thing and make sure the team stays aligned on that uh, from the technical perspective. Yeah, I'm Sven. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Gitpod. And yeah, my passion is uh, like I'm I'm an engineer also, but I really like look into the product. Um, stuff and yeah, it's awesome. So, uh, should we start by just saying, you know, what is GetPod and what what problem does it aim to solve? Yeah, of course. Um, so, GetPod is um, dev environments in the cloud. Basically, our claim is always be ready to code. So, what we want to make sure is that developers stop wasting their time on manually setting up local machines, you know, with databases, compilers, stuff like that, before they can start coding. Um, we, it's pretty simple. Like uh, We apply lessons learned from infrastructure as code and continuous integration. So what you do is you describe your development environment, which is not only the IDE, but all the tools you need. You describe that in code and have that part of your Git repository, so it's versioned. And with that, when someone pushes a change, we can always you know, recreate entire dev environments that are fully initialized and ready to code. We do that in the cloud. So when a developer comes by, wants to start a dev environment on a certain branch, it takes a couple of seconds in order to get dive into being creative and um, working on code. Yes, I think. It's, this kind of tooling is is becoming more and more important. You know, I think before we went live, I talked about my my aspirations of being able to survive on a Chromebook uh, as my day to day machine. And one of the challenges there is is having the toolings to work on projects. But even more importantly than that, you know, I think making the path easier for open source contributors to pick up a new project and a language that they're maybe not all that comfortable with, with tooling that they're not all that comfortable with, and have a tool like GitPod where they can click button and have a working environment for for making their first contribution, I think is, is vitally important. Um, so can we, if we understand what, what's the process then um, with GitPod, you know, is this something that we expect or uh, the maintainers of the projects to put together themselves when they're making it available in open source? Um, I mean, yeah, it's the, the configuration for that needs to be engineered by the team. So the team decides on what, what is the perfect dev environment for all of us. You know, there are means that you add your personal touches on, on top with key bindings and stuff like that. You can, you can do that for sure. But at the core, we decide as a team, like, okay, let's we use you know this compiler in that version, and we have this runtime, and we use that code generator, and we use that database, or we have even ten different databases in our unit test we want to test against, and uh, so that's all stuff you do as a team. It doesn't matter whether you do that in open source or in some commercial project. Um, you, of course, in open source, you have even more external collaborators, contributors for who you want to make, you know, pay for paths, make it super easy to contribute, spin up a dev environment. Um, but even in commercial projects, I mean, I've, I've been working as a consultant for 10, 15 years now. I haven't seen a project 
like a commercial real world project where I was up to speed in, in a couple of minutes. Usually it takes two days until you can you know, do do some work. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember an organization I worked at a few years ago where they forced all the developers to use an ID that was baked inside of a vagrant image and they all had to use the same settings and the same color scheme and the same key bindings and all of that. And I understand the intent there, but definitely not the ideal solution, whereas something like this seems much more flexible. Now, I think the most important question I'm going to ask you today is, does it have them key bindings? <laughs> <laughs> If, if there is a VS Code extension for Vim, then yes. Right, nice. So that's okay. So it loads VS Code extensions. That's awesome. Uh, let's pull up my my screen. So this is the GetPod homepage. Um, if you're following along at home or want to check this out in the replay, it is getpod.io. Um, so does is Get does it just use the VS Code extensions, or is it built on top of VS Code itself? Both. It's a bit um, like the IDE part of that is really not like the critical thing we want to get across. Like what we really want to achieve is that developers can bundle up the tools they love and they want to use, they would use locally. They bundle them up in this recipe that GitPod can execute and provide you in the cloud. So you should be able to use the IDE you love, right? When we started out, we saw, OK, like VS Code is a great IDE. We, we love it. And it seems to have a market share that is significant and, and, you know, and increasing. So we looked at VS Code and, and checked whether we can you know, somehow move it into the cloud, also talked with them, actually. And so at that point in time, they just came from the cloud. There was a, an online version of VS Code uh, many years ago. They moved it to the desktop build VS Code, and at, at that point, and they said, no, we are not interested in changing the architecture. Uh, we want to focus on desktop entirely. So what we did is we saw that uh, there are cool components, like the Monaco editor, and they you know, developed the language server protocol. So we yep. took those ingredients and created a, an online ID called FEA. We moved that to the Eclipse Foundation, because that's really not the point we want to make in Git, with GitPod is to build yet another IDE. We wanted to solve this dev environment stuff and give developers the ID they love. Um, but fast forward two years, Microsoft has changed its you know architectural decision. So they made VS change the architecture in VS Code so that it runs now nicely in browsers as well. And you know probably have heard of GitHub Code Spaces. And so they did that in the open source version. So since last week, you can choose in GitPod whether you want to use Thea or VS Code as a browser front end. In both IDEs, you can install any VS Code extension. All right, nice. To, to dwell on the point that really the IDE uh, that you're using is, is something that you can choose and not something that we pr uh, prescribe, um, there is a feature that's currently in private beta even where you can bring your own IDE as, as a Docker image. And that could be anything, you know, Jupyter Labs, Jupyter Notebook. Um, if you're so inclined, it could be just a terminal uh, with Emacs behind the scenes. Um, so really, the, the point is we want to automate the, the dev environment as a whole. And the IDE is one part of it. And we want to be orthogonal to the IDEs uh, that you might want to use. All right. So uh, yeah, that's. That's really important. I don't think I fully understand that. As I understood that as we were coming into this. You know, I was thinking, oh, it's an IDE that runs in the cloud and provides this other stuff. But really, there's just so much more to it than that. So, all right. So from this homepage, I can see a try now button just sitting there tempting me to click it. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that and see. So, ah, so I can just take any repository and add it to the end of that URL, and it's going to open it up for me. That's correct. So I already opened a few in advance. Um, for the audience, what I have here is a project called Git Series. Um, so good I wrote it twice, once in Rust, once in Go. Uh, I'll get into that another day of why I did that. But it is a project that can scan Git repositories and export metrics from it um, in a time series format. I also have another project. I seem to do a lot of Git now that I'm realizing this, but this one's called Git Sync. It's a GitOps operator written in Rust. And I have an Equinix Metal Terraform provider due to be renamed any day now, currently still says packet. 
And I'm just going to add this to the start. Uh, does the protocol matter? Should I remove that? Uh, it doesn't matter. And but for GitLab, actually, I'm not sure if it's like, no, let's let's continue. I will show you with the other repo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so now it's just saying log in and launch workspace. So I'll authorize this. All right. So do you want to give me a little bit of insight into what's actually happening here? Yeah, so what's happening in the background, um, or what just happened, was that um, Gitpod uh, understood from the URL that you provided, or that you, that was the suffix, basically. Uh, it understood which repository you wanted to open, which um, Git hosting provider you wanted it to open from. And it, as you then saw, talked to, to GitLab, signed you in so that you got access to uh, to that repository. And then behind the scenes, it started a, a Kubernetes pod um, with uh, the IDE in, with uh, user land in, with a default sort of uh, image um, that we call Workspace Fold that has a lot of tools um, installed already and uh, started the IDE for you. All right. Uh, I can see that it's downloaded all the Go modules. It's asking me if I want to set up the project or just never. Um, what do you think would be a good first step here? Will we click never or will we click set up? Should I just start breaking? Stuff? Oh, we can set it up. Yeah, we can set up your project. It's, it should be relatively easy. Okay. So, so the first thing you need to do is, um, like, you you know, you you could use and just code along here in, in this IDE now, but it's it's not, you know, it's there's no real kind of automation in there so it's just you know it's a checkout of, of the contacts you've you started with which is the default branch here um, with a gitpod yaml what you can do is you can tell gitpod what kind of for instance um, base docker image you want to have in your turn like when you you know when you're in, in your tools you want to maybe install um, additional tools like a database or stuff like that um, and also what kind of tasks should be executed so if you click create gitpod yaml it analyzes your project a bit. And um, if you double click the Gitpod YAML tab in the middle, you can make it full screen and you see what it analyzes. It's pretty simple. It says, like, okay, when you ever someone starts this project, we have two things we want to execute one after the other. First, we want to run go get, go build, and go test. And then afterwards, we want to run. Um, one. So that's just a super simple Go standard thing. Um, what is important here is there's this two different life cycles. It's, you know, there's init and there's command. The point is that init can be executed asynchronously. So when you check in this, you can install a webhook on your GitLab repository, and then we'll, Gitpod will run through this init phase whenever someone pushes a, a new branch, a new commit to any branches. And it runs through that, and then it takes a snapshot. And then when a, a, a real human being comes along and wants to start coding, you don't have to wait for this. So this is you know, it's very significant for a long-running build, like if you need to download the, the internet because you have so many dependencies or you know, do stuff like that, then you don't have to wait for that. You get a fully kind of initialized, compiled, code generated source code within a couple of seconds. Very cool. To, to bring the point home, how much time that saves, if you do that on, on Gitpod.io, the Gitpod.io repository itself, um, you'll save uh, about 12 minutes by not having to sit there and watch paint dry uh, code download and compile, right? Um, yeah, I could see, I could see a lot of benefits to the approach, definitely. Um, and I guess in a really weird way, if I were, you know, assuming it wasn't 2020 and I'm out on a, you know, holiday period, Christmas night out with my workmates and I need to fix something on my phone, I could, I'm assuming I could just pop that open and never have to leave the restaurant. So I like that idea. <laughs> and not that I've ever had to fix any production outage from a restaurant before. And it wasn't, <laughs> no. definitely wasn't painful. Okay. Uh, we actually had a, a question just as we were chatting there. So let's um, pop that up. So. 
Uh, Ofer is asking, will we show how to use or utilize Docker Compose and have that run containers when we start the workspace? Uh, yeah, we'll definitely try and get around to that. Okay, now, should I update this Docker configuration? Um, I'm assuming um, this is just a Docker file that is used to provide the tooling environment for this workspace. Okay. That, that's correct. So the, there are two ways you can provide the user land for your workspace. One is you can uh, list in an already built image, and we're going to pull that and use that. Or you can provide your own Docker file, check that in uh, in your repository, and then uh, whenever you make a change to that and open a new workspace on it, um, GitHub will build that for you. All right. I'm going to click it. Uh, OK, so you provide some defaults vnc <laughs> yeah it you know some not everything runs in the browser yet so um if you need to do something that doesn't run in the browser you need i know need to run ui tests for example um then uh, this image comes in handy and it starts a vnc server um, on a frame buffer and then gives you web vnc view to it all right cool uh i'll just click custom and I just it wants me to provide an image with a name. So what is the get pod workspace fill that it's suggesting here? That's so, the default one. We have a, like, you know, that's the one we are running currently on. Like if you don't provide anything, then we use the workspace full and it it you know the name is uh, accurate. It it has everything you probably might wanna have. So it's it's you know it's uh, yeah batteries included very big image that is um, fast to pull because it's it sits on every node already pre pulled um, but probably not what you really you know in a professional context you want to you know maybe say okay I really need this version of Go or I need that you know. And, and then you want to be very specific. So you would start with a hand-rolled um, Docker image. OK. Uh, I'll just skip this for now then. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you can, you can Yeah, you can now, you could generate a Gitpod Docker file, but please just don't, don't do that. Because we don't need that for the simple project. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of what I was uh, I yeah. was getting there. So okay, um, so we can let others know that this project. I'm going to click update readme because I just like clicking the blue button. All right, we can uh, just close the tab on the right. There's this icon. Yeah, click on it. Thanks. All right, let's pop this terminal down. Uh, let's see what that's done to my readme then. Oh, it wants me to update something and just say, hey, this is. It, yeah, it added this button, this badge to the top. If you click the preview icon on the top right, yeah, that one, that one, you see what it did. Ah, oh, got it. OK, so you've added a badge then that allows other people to pop this open inside of Gitpod. Right. Excellent. Uh, that was all pretty painless. <laughs> so. I guess and now I can start making changes to this application and just develop it as I normally would. Like not really much should change with my normal developer workflow. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So if you open a um, a Go file, for example, I saw earlier the Go get uh, looks like it uh, didn't go through because of some native dependency, but uh, by and large, you know, it, it will run Go please behind the scenes. Um, it's the VS Code Go extension um, that we all know. Um, so it should, you should feel right at home. Uh, yeah, it seems to have failed here because libgit uh, was not available. So this is just a Debian box. So in theory, I should just be able to install that, right? Uh, let's see if I got sudo. So this uh, brings us to a um, good point that is uh, currently in, in feature preview. So we have. Uh, sort of this, you could consider it a better feature channel, um, like you have with many other projects, uh, that you can enable in the settings. And this would give you sudo. Uh, and then you could just do exactly what you were trying to do. Um, if you want, we can go ahead and, and just enable that. Um, this would also, though, be a good use case for this Docker file that we were just about to create, because this is something that everyone in your team will need. Everyone who opens this project will need that library. 
Um, so there's a good chance you'll want that installed in the user land for everyone, right? You don't want everyone after they open the workspace to have to go and do up get install. Yeah. Uh, lip git. All right. So what do you want me to do first? <laughs> I think it'd be best now, probably if we um, enable the the feature preview just to show that off, and it really helps sort of uh, getting that Docker file um, ready. To do that, uh, if you on the upper right corner on your avatar, and then click on Open Workspaces, and then again in the upper right corner in the avatar, hit Settings, and then there you see the feature preview at the bottom. Oh, yeah, there we go. If you tick that, that's it. And so the next workspace, any next workspace that you'll start will have um, support for sudo, apt-get, etc. The the code that you just ticked is um, exactly what uh, Sven alluded to earlier, where we're really not opinionated about the IDE that you want to use. And there is some uh, some code support in there. It's still a bit rough around the edges, I would say. So I wouldn't recommend that that we take it on now. Okay. Uh, just you know, some things like uh, extensions being pre-installed are, are still in the works. About to land, the PR is actually on the repository. Um, so let, let's continue with that. Okay. And so that just saves automatically, right? There's not anything yes. I have to do here. Okay. So I can just close this, mm -hmm. and then we come back to here. Do I need to reload this workspace? You would have to stop and start it again. And to do that, uh, again, the upper right corner or the command palette in, in VS Code, so Command Shift P, and then stop workspace. And that will. It's important to note that this is only something you have to do you know, right now because we're changing these settings. Um, once these settings are enabled, this is not something that, um, that you'll have to do again. OK. So we're just waiting for this to stop. I'm assuming my start button is going to come back, and we just go straight back in. Correct. Nice. And it's backing up now, like the file system of your workspace. So you, you know, get that state back again. But when I've earlier explained that we have this pre-built feature, and and you know, it, it allows you to skip the waiting, the real reason behind that, you can start the workspace now. Yeah, I just thought this was quite interesting here. Uh -huh. that it's kind of all those changes that I started to make are still going to be available when I come back, which is really cool. Yes. It also, it also tells you what, what did change. And you see that here in the tab. So if you have a bunch of Gitpod tabs closed, you can see what state they were in. And it will also show that in, in the dashboard. Um, so you know, if you have a list of, in the workspace list, so if you have a list of workspaces, you can then still see what was in in case you left something accidentally, for example. OK. What's we, are so explicit, we are so explicit about these changes thing and so on, because we know we want to emphasize or allow people to treat dev environments as ephemeral or disposable. So we would always you know, start fresh. You usually don't do that, like stopping and starting workspaces again, uh, unless you are working on the long running feature branch or so. And so when you go to your workspaces list, this is just really your history. Like, And there should be little reason to restart these workspaces because we can always rely on the automation and get the freshly prepared ones on the latest you know, state of your branches when you go to GitLab and start from there. So that's a, that's a workflow. You always start fresh and even in parallel. And then you just close your tab, and GitHub will take care of you know, or even garbage collect. Like we are stopping the workspace, um, and then eventually, after 14 days of inactivity, it will be garbage collected. So you don't have to clean up after you. Ah, cool. To to illustrate that point further, on a good day, I'll have anywhere between 20 to 25 workspaces. Right. I'll have I'll have two to three running in parallel, like this and that PR that I'm trying to review. This feature that I'm working on while I'm waiting for build somewhere else, um, and the only time I really ever restart one is when I come back from lunch, and that's about it. I think the okay. So I've got two questions. Um, first one, ask me if I want to install a Chrome extension. I'm curious what what does that bring to the environment? It adds a button like that says "Get Part" to all your 
So every GitHub and, and Bitbucket org and GitLab repository, even pull request, merge request issues. So you can start from any, you know, you see in the internet, you see code, there is a Git pop button next to it, you click it, and then you, you can code on that. Awesome, good. That like led me on to my well, what my next question was going to be there because because you just said, you know, about pull requests. I mean, if I have a pull request to the repository and you know it's not always great to look at it in the, the GitHub view, then I can open that specific fork, that branch, that revision inside of a Git pod and actually walk through the changes in a more familiar environment, right? Okay. Yeah, it even notices that you are starting on a if you start from a pull request. It, the IDE doesn't open like this. It opens with the changes on the left, and then you can skip, go through that, and you see, you know, diff editors, and you can even comment in line in the editor. Like, you, know, I, you don't have to go back to GitHub in order to do your code review. You just do it from the IDE. You can even approve or, you know, comment, reject, whatnot. Okay. I mean, we're definitely going to have to try that to do then, <laughs> because I maintain that I help some Helm charts repositories. Uh, I run the InfluxDB Helm charts, and it gets a lot of pull requests. It's a lot of work, and anything that can simplify that for me, like I'm immediately sold. So hopefully, we can try that. Let's let's do something uh, rudimentary with this Go setup, and then maybe we can look at one of those pull requests and see how that works. Uh, all right, so. We enabled a feature preview because we want the ability to do sudo. So I'm just going to do sudo ls, and that now worked. But you also suggested that this libgit2 is not something that we want to have everybody install manually. So we probably want to add our own gitpod.docker file. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. What so the, the flow that, that I find works is, you know, first you got to find out the exact name of the package that you want to install. So now we could, in, in this terminal, we could do um, up, get update, up install, um, just to make sure we're picking the right package and that our app uh, go get runs through. And then we, we take that and we package that into the, into the Docker file. Okay. Uh, so we will need libget to dash dev. Um, is there a helper for creating this Docker file or should I just go ahead and do like new file here? There is, you can also open the view on the right with the get pod, um icon again and update Docker configuration once more. Use default and yes, generate a GitHub Docker file. Okay, so now, it, okay, yeah. So that name is completely, whatever I want it to be. This is just what's set by default. Okay, cool. Because uh, I, I, I very fussy over files on my repository. So <laughs> it's nice that that's an option. All right, let's get this working then. So uh, now I ran an app update from this terminal because I'm just used to container images really stripping all that stuff out. Is that the same for GetPod or does that step unnecessary here? I think you need to do that. Yeah. Be wary, beware that this uh, later will run headless, right? So uh, if you do uh, apt install or apt get install, you need to make sure that it's not asking exactly. It's not asking for confirmation or anything like that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just set this to uh, front end. Effective. And this environment variable will later be available in your workspace too. So if you set it here like this, then in your workspace, it will be set like that as well, exactly. Right, okay, we'll do, it, we'll do it cleaner. Uh, and this I, does not run as root, so you better put sudo before. Okay, oh, I'm going to edit there. Oh, there we go. Uh, and sudo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So now that I've added a Docker file and made some changes, is there anything I need to do to switch to this new image? Yes. You need to get that into your remote Git repository. So you need to create a branch and push it there because it's Git first. You know, Git pod, yeah, you open new dev environments from, from Git. So if you have it on a branch or on your fork, whatever, um, and you start different moments from there. Gitpod understands. Okay, that's um, you know that's the configuration uh, I need to to choose. 
I'm assuming I can just use these tools here to yep. to do that. Okay, so I can say um, added pod configuration. You can also create a, a branch in the status bar where it says master. If you click on that, then it will ask you if you want to create a new branch. Okay. And then you need to stage. Yeah, with plus. And then the small tick up top. Uh, yep. That's it. And to push, you can use the command palette. You can use git push in your terminal. Um, and that's it. OK, so I guess I should pull this back up from here. And it was git series go. Right. So should I just create a merge request? Yeah, you don't have to in order to change it. You can, to test it, you can also just go to the branch without a merge request. You mean from? Yeah, you, you select that one. And then you see the web ID button. I want to show you, like, use the dropdown and choose GitPod because GitPod has a native integration in GitLab, so you don't need to prefix this stuff. Uh, okay, okay, now you can use it. You have just had it enabled once. And this is opening the branch. Okay. Correct. You see the, the context URL on top? Uh, yes. Right. Oh, I broke it. <laughs> so I'll start with the default image and fix that, I guess. You can go to the uh, to the other workspace and fix the problem and then just force push again. But I, I couldn't spot the problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, I forgot it equals sign. So I, I just tried to run oh, yeah. it as a, as a command. Mm -hmm. so, uh, OK, so I'll just amend that commit so we can stage this. Yes, you can use the amend button. Yeah. Uh, and then just that one. Perfect. OK. And you guys still got to push. So if you, uh, again, you can just use the command palette for that. Force push. Oh, yeah, yeah. you have to force push, yeah. OK. So let's just pop back to here and try that again. And it's attempting to then build our custom image, which should hopefully this time work. <laughs> yeah, it looks better. OK. And you were saying this only does this once. So anyone else that now comes to this project, they're just going to get the built version of this image and not have to wait, right? Correct. Until you make a change to, to the image of course, or to the file, of course. OK. And what we should see, the reason that we did this was because libget caused our goal build to fail earlier. So now when this pops open, we should see our terminal sitting there with a, a built binary, I'm assuming. Okay. Correct. Yeah, and it should execute the things we listed in the tasks in the GitHub YAML now because we pushed the GitHub YAML as well. Oh, excellent. Uh... Oh, no. <laughs> I think this is just a go thing now. This is not anything that we've done. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that error message. Maybe there's some version. The version in the um, Ubuntu uh, package yeah, yeah. Uh, doesn't match up with what uh, we're expecting here. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, we installed lib28 because that was what available in Ubuntu, and this uses version 30. Uh, so let's just see if this fixes it. If not, we can move to another project. I'm going to have to get a specific version for that, I think. Let's see. Uh, 
This is uh, twenty eight eight six twenty eight uh, and then download. See if that makes it a little bit happier and go build. I'm to go some. I broke it. Oh well, not important. Uh, oh, it's just added that back in actually. This is why I try to avoid using libgit whenever possible. There is a, a good git uh, go native git implementation as well. Oh really? Uh, okay, I don't know if I really want to keep trying to fix this. Yeah, so the the, ver the V30 import seems to be across a few files. Um, and I just don't think that's important. So let's pop open something else then. Let's do the Rust project. Feeling brave, right? Think. Let's see. Get pod io slash pound hash whatever we want to call that. Uh, get menu environment. So you mentioned earlier that get pod tries to kind of does it do language detection? It tries to work out what sensible default makes sense for each repository. Is is that correct? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yes and no. So it, it does that in, in some very simple cases, like the ones that we've seen for, for Go. Um, but it's not very, uh, yeah. OK. Um, elaborate. So because this is using the workspace full image, does that just mean as pre-baked with um, binaries and languages, uh, like support for popular languages? Because mm -hmm. I do have That's access good. to Rust-C here. Uh, yeah. I do have PHP, Perl. I mean, I'm hitting quite a lot of languages here, so. Node, Python, Go. Oh, all right. So let's click set up project again. We'll create the git pod. It has detected, so it's a bit small. <laughs> so, so I did detect it was Rust. It knows that I want to do a cargo build, a cargo watch. Um, I don't think we're going to need that. I'll update the README with the cool button again. Oh. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, I'll skip it. Is, is there a README? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a bit of a cowboy developer, so it's very likely that there's not, for sure. Uh, all right, and then we'll just push that and start. Okay. So I can do cargo build. the crates. It's going to compile that one. Maybe going to work. You know, I don't even know. I've picked another repository that uses libgit again. So who knows what's going to happen? Um, although maybe it's happier. So one thing. Come sorry, Nico. Sorry. Uh, one thing that uh, you know might seem minor, but actually really works in. Uh, in the daily life of a developer is that exactly because your workspace is now running in the cloud, um, download speeds are just so much faster. Like in downloading libraries, uh, dependencies, Docker images, you name it, uh, you know, it just flies off. It's... Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, the download speeds were pretty quick. Although, unfortunately, I don't think you can speed up the Rust build times, which are notoriously bad. So. <laughs> We can eliminate them by, you know, running them in a pre-build. Like all everything we are waiting here for would be something we could do asynchronously. Well, that was pretty quick, and I've, I've actually, I think this is now just working. Target. Oh no, this is just a library, so there's no target. So yeah, that worked. Um, now this is, I, I would just code as normal now, right? Like I would pop open my file. Oh, that's my commented stuff. There we go. And I have everything that I need to work. Awesome. 
Um, are there any features um, from this IDE interface that you want to cover before we, we carry on? Is there anything here that is maybe slightly different to the way that I would work normally? Um, the thing that's jumping out to me, I'll just throw out there as a suggestion. I, I see no open ports. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we're doing there is if you have some service running in your workspace that listens on a port, um, Gitpod will detect that and then uh, we'll make it available um, outside of the workspace. You can open that in, in your browser. And by default, they are private, meaning that only you can access it because you know, you're locked into Gitpod. Um, but you can also make them public and then anyone can just access that. Um, so you could, I don't know, provide an endpoint to some other service, or you can share that with a colleague to download something, stuff like that. OK, so does that mean random, stupid? Oh, I didn't. And, oh, yeah, that'll work. Uh, if I just install Nginx on this, I can yeah, expose that, and someone can just browse to Nginx. <laughs> That's correct. Oh, it detected it as well. Uh, all right, open a preview. I have an Nginx page. Uh, make public. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Nice. So obviously, if I was, this again, me, I'm on forum today. I've picked two really bad examples for showing off a feature. But if I was working on a, a website or a React application, being able to just run that dev server expose the port like I have done for Nginx here and give that link to people. They can just come in and see exactly where I am, what's working, what's not working, et cetera. Um, is there, like, if I want, to, if you wanted to, like, pair with me on an issue, is there, like, any support for that where we'd be able to modify the code at the same time? So there is some, uh, there are two ways of, of sharing your workspace. Uh, one is you can share the the workspace as it's running. So at the moment, this just means you're giving someone else access to basically to your machine, right? Like your workspace. But it, the example is like you're handing your laptop to someone else, <laughs> kind of like that. Um, the, you share some of the the terminals at that point, um, and we're still working on adding some like Google Doc style live editing that you also share editors. And the other mode of sharing is where you can share a snapshot. So say you have a problem right now, or you have something that you would like to demonstrate, uh, then you can create a snapshot of your current state, which produces a link that uh, then you can put into an issue, share on Slack, something like that. And then someone else can go and open that link and get a snapshot based on your current state, but it's going to uh, get a workspace, excuse me, based on your current state, but it's going to be a separate workspace, right? It's like a copy that uh, was branched off it. And where you took that snapshot. Okay, cool. So you are working on Google Docsy style code editing stuff. Nice. We do, yeah. In theory, you could also use the live share extension from Microsoft. It's just that their license doesn't allow it to install it in other in, in non Visual Studio products at the moment. Um, so, but we are working on a, you know on, on, on some collaborative editing extensions for Gitpod. Very, very cool. OK. Um, you shared a curl command with me. Yeah, this is a really quick way to get a get a web server up and running, so you know, short of installing Nginx. If you just need a web server that serves a file, uh, you, pu you push that in, and it's um, going to spin up a web server for you. Ah, right, OK. Nice thing is that that works independently of any kind of, you know, whatever, whatever you have installed. Behind the scenes, it just downloads a Go binary and runs it. Um, so this is going to work. And I could never remember the Python line or you know the PHP line, and it's just going to start a web server. It's really handy for debugging. Yeah, that's a really cool tip, actually. I wasn't familiar with that. So, uh, all right, let's. Uh, we got another question from Ofer. Working on my computer, I can save a file today, and it will be available forever. And GetPod, how long can I keep files that I saved in ID but have not yet been pushed to the repository? There, uh, yeah, I mentioned before we have an automatic garbage collection thing. So by default, if you don't restart your workspace for two weeks, then it, it gets um, deleted. There is one another week um, where we, we could um, restore state. Um, 
but you can pin your workspace. If you want to have a long living workspace, so you want to do the same everyone does locally, like you have this, you know, stateful stuff that you massage over uh, your lifespan, then you can do that in Gitpod as well. You can have one workspace pin it and then it will never be uh, garbage collected. You can restart that, manually sync and so on. It's just, you know, we are trying to educate people to get rid of that because it is, uh, you know, the, the root cause for configuration drift and, and very different states in, in environments where, you know, you, you cannot really call this dev environments as code if you do not re-execute the automation all the time. If you do it once and then you massage it from there, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's nice for starters, basically, but, but then you, you do the same stuff you do locally. Yeah, you're just trying to encourage some best practices for people across the board. Right. Um, so if I just close this tab, that workspace is going to continue to run until I go back to it, until it gets garbage collected. But, you know, is there a way that is, should I like click stop? Like, or so the think... workspace is going to run for another two minutes after you close the tab, just in case you accidentally closed it. And you know, command shift T, ah, still there. Uh, so it does that. Um, you can also explicitly stop it um, in the file menu in the command palette, um, okay. whichever suits your your workflow. All right. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you forget about it, you know, you get distracted, you go to lunch or whatever. Uh, the timeout is 30 minutes by default. Um, and there are, there are ways also to extend it to three hours in, in some of the professional plans. But yeah, I think 30 minutes is, is, is pretty, pretty OK. But in that case, you just come back and you see, oh, it stopped. You started again and continue your work. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to play with this now. See if I can find some extensions. I change this theme. It doesn't seem to be returning. Yeah, so we are like the IDEs in GetPod, they do not point to the Microsoft Marketplace. Oh. Because again, that is not OK due to the terms. So in order to make um, these, all these open source US code extensions available to everyone and also com competition projects like, like GetPod and so on. We created the OpenVSX marketplace. We moved that to the Eclipse Foundation so that it's really in a vendor neutral place. You know that, And then uh, now this, this is kind of getting adoption. So VS Codium, uh, like that is the real open source version of VS Code. They are also pointed to OpenVSX uh, now by default. Um, get part like all FIA IDEs um, would point to OpenVSX by default. Um, yeah, and if there's something missing, you can go to the project and you know create an issue and, and just yeah make sure it, it gets added. Okay, I'm just gonna keep clicking stuff. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's actually the one I use locally sometimes anyway. Very cool. All right, uh, let's close this down. Um, I really want to check out the pull request stuff that we talked about earlier. So let's pull that up. Um, um, will I need the extension then to do this? Or I'm assuming no. that GitHub won't have the same native thing that GitLab had. No, you just go to your pull request. OK. Uh, all right, let's just pick this one. Uh, so can do, do, see code space. So did I just get pod at the start? Correct. Yeah. Correct. If you have the the browser extension installed, then you're also going to see a, a button in the upper right corner. All right, cool. And this is going to give me a slightly different view that we've we've seen with the last two projects because it's detecting that I was an a pull request from these. Correct. All right. Okay, what have I got? Oh, so it's just straight into the, the death mode. I can click through the files.
double click. Uh, yeah. Double click and then ah. <laughs> And then you can also use the cursor um, keys in order to navigate through all the changes one by one. And you can add comments if, in case you, you know, have questions or. Okay, so, I mean, I've already uh, approved this, but if I wanted to add a comment, what? Mm -hmm. You have a, you have a over the, the change line on the right hand side, like, uh, and you see this uh, conversation symbol. You click on it. Ah, okay. Ah, so this is pretty. It feels pretty similar to what I would actually do from the GAB side. I can add a single comment, or actually start a review and, and build up all those comments. And right, and you would also see all existing comments here. There is a comments view even, um, and also on the right hand side, you see the GitHub symbol. There, you see more details on the pull request, and so you see conversations. If you click on conversations, you would see you know existing conversations. Okay. Also, jump to the files and see them in the, the different contexts. Very, very cool. This is a much better experience for working with a pull request than uh, working from the GitHub UI. I like it. It also um, means you can try it out directly because you have a full blown dev environment. You know, this isn't just yet another view on, on the PI itself, but you have a terminal. And if your project is Git Podified, if you have a configuration, everything is. You know, set up and ready to go, and you can run tests, um, debug even, and then try it out proper. Uh, the workspace fill doesn't come with Helm, I don't think. With control. Yeah. But I could provide them with my own image, because this is a Helm Church repository, so the tooling that I need is <laughs> kind of specific. All right. Is there any integration with uh, GitHub Actions? Like, Would I be able to see if the if the last run was successful or if it failed and what failed, or is that something I would have to jump back over to GitHub to investigate? Yeah, for There's that, nothing would... special, but there are probably an extension around that that you could install. Um, but yeah, we do not use uh, GitHub Actions, so uh, I don't really know. Oh, okay. I mean, I guess that's the other cool thing is that this has access to the open VSX marketplace. So if there's an extension out there that already has GitHub action status support, then it's just going to magically work anyway. So that's pretty cool. Thanks. Nice. Um, uh, do I have the ability to approve the pull request from here? Yes, usually. Wherever you change this. Yeah, there we go. And, uh, and then I can just review this. I can just approve mm -hmm. it again. Uh, oh, I think permissions. Um, you need a new scope, probably. Interesting. Yeah, I don't um, think. I can't remember if I authenticated with GitHub or not. Maybe I did. You okay. can review that in the uh, upper right corner on your avatar. Uh, there is a point called access control. The second, yeah, that one. And there you can see what uh, permissions your current token has on. Okay. Yeah. I, write public repos is, I guess, the thing you would need. Uh, oh, that's annoying. <laughs> Let me grab that. Yeah, so by default, we try and, you know, grab the least privileges uh, for your account possible. And then you know, as you uh, need more, um, usually we ask for it. All right, that worked. I've now approved it again. Uh, and I can and even you can add. jump, yeah. You, you can even merge or go back to GitHub by clicking on the, uh, the issue number on the top right. If I can merge it from here, where it's asking me if I want to do a squash or a rebase, or I can click the issue number, I come over here and just go ahead and do that. So there you go. Nice. Uh, that's very convenient. I can see um, just how useful that kind of is there. Uh, with regards to the, the setups, 
Um, how would one contribute to get pod to understand that this was a helm charts repo like what would be the process for that like if i was like hey i work at helm charts a lot i want to make get pod work better by default for these kind of repositories is there as is there some way for me to contribute that towards a project um the, the way you would solve that is for your project you know we can't we, we like get pod is really designed to be non-opinionated about what kind of projects to support so we want you it won't allow developers to just say, okay, I, I need this tool, that tool, that CLI tool, that extensions, and so on, and please bundle that up for me. So you would put that into your Docker, the Docker file, as we did previously with, with the Git uh, library. We would add uh, view control and Helm um, as part of your Docker file. If you say, hmm, this is a really common case, and I know there is this, you know, detection mechanism in GitPod, I want to contribute to that. Of course, um, the GitPod is open source. So that you go to GitHub, GitPod.io, GitPod, which is a repository, and you can you know look whether there are some uh, feature requests around this already, or you file one, and then set, you know, indicate you want to contribute this. And uh, we, we can see whether that fits the scope of the project and, and where to best to make to the contribution. Yeah, I guess what I was more—I guess what I was curious about was like, um, you know, if I come here, for instance, uh, and I add the get pod mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we added that custom Docker file, really all we did—I can't remember the exact syntax, so, you know—but but roughly we said, hey, there's this image, which is built from this file. Can I just tell it to use? Say, I publish some get pod images called Helm. Um, and tell people, hey, if you if you want to add a Git pod YAML to your project, then use this image, and it'll come with all the tools that you need for Helm. You know, rather than all of these other developers also adding their own Git pod Docker file. So, you know, providing maybe some semantics around that, I guess. So yeah, of course you can do that. Like, and also, and we have this, you know, Docker images repository where we maintain those that were proposed when you you know earlier used the setup versus there were a list of files or docker images that were proposed right the workspace full but also the one with vnc or different databases and so on those are maintained in an open source repository and um, there are some some more you know for, for very typical setups and then it might make sense yeah okay perfect uh so let me ask uh, another question then do you use Git pod to build Git pod? Sure. <laughs> we um, and we have done so for for quite a long time at this point. Um, two years, easy. Okay. Does your Git pod have a Docker compose file, or should I throw one together in this project? No. Okay. Let's throw one together in here. Okay. And then, all right. So we'll do that just so we had a question about how that would work. So let's show that. And then we can open get pod and get pod. And then I think that's a pretty good overview of, of what get pod is and how it makes developers' lives better. So let's see. Make sure I can remember how to build one of these things. So um, let's just do engine X. Assume we're going to run that. Um, and I can just add the ports, uh, and I'll add one more. I see I can remember how to do it, and then I would get it wrong. Okay, um, let's add something with PHP. We'll do the CLI image. So this is a really simple and contrived Docker Compose file. <laughs> I'll make that just a little bit bigger. Um, let's close this down just now, and. We do have access to Docker Compose and the workspace fill image. Correct. So the first thing you would want to do is uh, actually start the the Docker daemon, and uh, this is still a preview feature. So you know we're still fleshing out the UX, and it was important to give people access to this uh, as soon as possible. For now, to start uh, the Docker daemon, you type sudo uh, docker minus up, and that will do the rest. And that just started the uh, the Docker daemon now. Okay. How do I open a new terminal? There we go. And would I just work with my standard tooling normally? So I would just run a Docker Compose up here. 
Yep. Yeah, we don't. It doesn't matter if that container exits. It's not really important. And it's pretty quick at downloading the images. Benefits of cloud. Yeah, my connection's not that fast, so that's pretty cool. <coughs> so you said that the the start of the episode. This is just running as a Kubernetes pod. That is correct. Yes. So the uh, Git pod as a whole. Uh, so now it did the Docker compose up and recognized that there's something running. Um, and, and the status bar where it says ports, if you click that again, then you'll find a button where you can uh, exactly open browser. There you go. Yeah, so I mean, this is, <laughs> this is just my native dev workflow. Like, you know, this could be, you know, I've added PHP, but this could be MySQL. It could be any, it could be Postgres, MongoDB. My application would just be configured to speak on localhost like in any other other setup. There's nothing particularly, it, it doesn't change anything, which I like. Like all my native tooling is still the exact same, only I'm using someone else's computer, which, <laughs> which is a nice benefit. Which you don't have to set up. Which you don't have to set up, exactly, yeah. Um, all right. <laughs> It was just too easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very impressed. I, I, I like it. It's just, you know, I don't feel like I've been, there's not been any friction. It's not been frustrating. I've just clicked. I mean, and the fact that I can just use get pod IO as a prefix on any repository and pull request is, is very, very cool. You've definitely put a lot of effort into the kind of user experience here. And I think that shines through. So great job. Um, all right. Let's. Do, uh, if there's any more questions or anything that you want to understand about Gitpod, feel free to drop them in the comments. Um, we'll open up the Gitpod repository now. Um, I'm assuming it's just going to work as well, but still be fun to do. So do you host the Gitpod source code on GitHub, GitLab, or somewhere else, or both? <laughs> it is GitHub. GitHub. Currently. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pop over. Get pod IO. Yeah, right. And we'll add the prefix. So would you say this is the best example of a project configured for get pod usage? Um, for ourselves, probably, but for people who are not so involved in it, I guess uh, it's good. Like examples are pretty good if they, you know, get out of the way and show off, you know, the thing you really want to show. So I like, for instance, stuff like you know, the pet clinic project or to -do, the typical to do apps that have this, you know, like everyone knows the problem and everyone knows what's going on there, but then you have still like this configuration with the database and an app server and so on. A really good real world configuration is also the GitLab project itself. Like, you know, GitLab or GitLab is using GitPod for development. And so that configuration is also like that's a, that's a huge project. And there is, um, you know, the configuration is, is not. Very simple. It's a All right. One so, sorry, you go. Sorry. One good thing to show here now is the in the terminal in in both terminals actually. So we had tasks running in parallel originally. You see this this message. Um, this task ran as part of a workspace prebuild. And what that basically means is that you know all the code in this workspace has already been built. Dependencies have been downloaded. Uh, you're ready to go. Uh, so I'm always quite happy when I see that banana because it basically tells me I don't have to go and get a coffee now. Yeah, like that XKCD comic where it's like, oh, it's compiling. No, sorry, we've done that in advance. Stop slacking off. <laughs> <laughs> so two things have jumped out at me with this repository. One, the theme I installed in the last repository is, is now seems to be global for my my set my editor experience so i'm assuming all my keyboard shortcuts and stuff like that are all just going to transfer between which is really cool um i also noticed that this opened two terminals side by side is this something you've configured in the gitpod yaml or is this 
Yeah, okay. Uh, let's take a look at it then. Uh, is this Before a mono repo? Yes. <laughs> Good. I was going to ask you a question about mono repos, so that's uh, very handy. All right, let's drop this down and see what we've got in here. So, uh, got a pre baked dev environment image hosted on GCR. Trigger the workspace location and a checkout location. And there are a lot of ports. <laughs> uh the tasks we've not seen the before syntax yet is that just like it go, runs before the init command itself yeah so the what the before does is it runs before anything else um and it does so independently of the um of the life cycle that sven mentioned earlier so before will run uh, in a pre-built but it will also run in um not a pre-built like if you start a regular workspace all right. And if you have multiple tasks, you can just add this open mode to tell it to run in a separate thing. And there's a list of VS Code extensions, which you think will make my life easier here. So that's pretty cool, too. I don't know if this is, I, I don't know if there are conversations or whatnot, but you know, VS Code has some sort of uh, file like this. Is there any chance of standardization there that I'd find this once and it works on both? You know, get pod, VS Code, and in, in IntelliJ products or whatever like that. Like, do mm. you see that being something that happens? Um, I, I guess so. Eventually, we see like you know how what is commonly being used. But um, given that you know GitHub and and Microsoft have a lot of reach, and the Dev Container format, and that's the format you're talking about. Um, it's pretty nicely designed. Um, so we have an our roadmap. Yeah, the, the plan to eventually support that. It's not you know highest on the list, but because also adoption is not really very interesting currently. But I, I assume this will change a bit. So maybe Q2, Q3 next year, you'll have some sort of support for this format as well. Um, it's important that you know here we have some some more like some additional information that we would need in order to do st stuff like the pre-builds and so on, because that's not supported by, by the format um, from, from VS Code. But it would be a great start and would make it super easy for people to start a GitHub workspace for repositories that have the dev container format, for sure. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to add, like, I wanted to add one thing to the thing you mentioned before, David, regarding like your theme is now on every workspace. This is because you install that as a user. I'm not sure if you uh, remember. It was asked whether you want to install it on a workspace or a producer. Um, and installing themes for user makes a lot of sense. These extensions here, sorry, these extensions here are installed for workspaces. That's why it's shared within. You know, the get YAML and then with it with it with the entire team. Yeah, I did remember the the pop up. It said, "Do you want to make us a, a workspace extension or a user extension?" I did like user because obviously I don't want to force my theme on everyone else. I guess that uses this for um, yeah. Is there anything we should show from the get pod setup? Like, how does the mono repository stuff work here? Like, you know, I've got maybe a part of it that's Go. I'm assuming the UI is, is TypeScript and React. Like, how does this all work together? Yeah. So the um... The key challenge that we see is for one that uh, Go please needs um, each Go um, Go module to be its own workspace root. So the way we set up the repository is um, under components. We basically have the, the you know the components that make up um, this project, and they're a mix of uh, TypeScript and Go, and then. Uh, each Go component um, is its own Go module. We don't have a root Go module, and uh, they're added as as workspace roots. And that, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. All right, awesome. Uh, is there anything I should show here, or is there anything <laughs> anything that we haven't covered so far about the Get Pod configuration that you think is is important to cover? I mean, we could briefly uh, show debugging. Um, I mean, it, you know, it, at the end of the day, it works like you would expect it to work um, in in your local VS Code as well. But for example, you know, debugging Go tests, for example, um, works just the same way. Um, 
Yeah, actually, I think I've got that vibe as we've been going through a few of the projects here. It's like you're not trying to change the way that people work. Everything just all that experience that developers have, they're they're continuing to use that even though their environment is removed or moved to to some sort of cloud compute. So, um, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Like we we you're probably not trying to rebuild people's habits. So they've got five years, ten years of experience of working with their tools. So awesome. All right. Uh, I'll just unshare my screen. Maybe we could then start to wrap up and talk about the the roadmap for GitPod, what's coming next. I'm also really curious about the the pricing. Like, I've not paid anything. I've not given you any card details. All of this is just free. Um, how does that work? Uh, how does it work? Um, yeah, it is. We like GitPod is available as a GitPod IO, which is a SaaS service, and and then also there is GitPod is open source, so you can also self-host it on your own Kubernetes clusters. Um, for the self-hosted version, there is the possibility to you know unlock certain features with an enterprise license. We try to keep everything that is very you know developer specific in open source, and everything that is more you know important for. Um, larger teams or even companies, managers, and so on, we would put into the um, the enterprise license. Uh, for GitHub.io, we have a freemium subscription. We want to support the open source development. Also, we see this as um, you know a kind of a bit of a different way of developing, like especially especially with automating and having these ephemeral dev environments and so on. So it is really a good opportunity to you know, lower the friction for open source contributors. Um, so this is kind of a really important thing to have a good freemium subscription so that it can be used in these um, scenarios easily and people see and understand the value. And yeah, eventually we might need to make some money also, of course, but um, uh, currently, you know, the focus is really on solving the problem for the developer community. Yeah, definitely. Uh, can I use GitPod on the free plan with private repositories, or is that where the the kind of the paying comes in? You can use it for one month uh, in a trial, but then after that, the paying comes in. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And and what about the the roadmap then? What what are what are the team working on? Um, besides those features we, that are just currently released in preview, like having VS Code as well as the uh, and also the um, the sudo and root support, uh, we need to flesh that out um, some more. We have a feature that Chris built actually a couple of months ago already, which is not entirely rolled out, called full workspace backup. That means currently we have a certain volume, which is a workspace folder. That is the stuff that we would back up between the in the, in the GitHub sessions. Uh, with the new version, everything gets back up. It doesn't matter where you have installed that. Um, we have some other like very exciting feature is the SSH access, which will allow to use code remote SSH and also what JetBrains is working on to connect with GitHub workspaces. So you can even use your desktop IDE and in, 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 together with GitHub. Um, the collaborative editing um, feature mentioned before is important. I'm not sure, Chris, uh, I guess I forgot about a few things in the roadmap. I think for the uh, upcoming time, that's that's it. So uh, we're also the, the self-hosted version that uh, Sven mentioned, um, we have uh, convenient installers for those, you know, that make it easy to to install them on on GKE and AWS, um, and we're looking into you know improving those, making those more stable, um, baking in more and more Terraform support on that end. Um, so also from that side, um, we're working on that. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, it's a really cool project. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to allow me to finally migrate to use my Chromebook. I can see even even beyond that on my Mac and on my Linux machines why I'd still prefer this kind of environment as well. There's a lot of benefits and consistency that can be adopted here. And the pull request format was just icing on the cake. So I'm really happy with that as well. Um, is there anything you would like to uh, say or share with us before we finish up today? Nope. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, thanks, David. That's what I want to say. Like, it's really nice to have this. It was also nice no, having no preparation for this session, but I also think it's it's really good to have this spontaneous, you know, just talk <laughs> about the product. And yeah, that's good. Yeah, some people love it. Some people hate it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I think we we had a really good look at Gitpod here. I think it's a really cool technology. Um, I love that it's open source as well. So, you know, great job. Uh, thanks again. I look forward to seeing what happens in the future. And thanks again for joining me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah.